How are we doing today, everybody? Happy Friday. Um, we are so excited to be here uh, talking about some insurance. You know, one of the, the most fun things to do in our practices. Uh, my name is Brian Lewis. I'm the director of marketing here at OrthoFi. Uh, appreciate everybody joining us for our latest, you know, OrthoFi webinar series um, with this, the insurance expert, Tina Byrne. Um, I know a lot of our clients are, are on the call today. So for all of you guys who are OrthoFi users, thank you so much for joining us. All the OrthoBank users out there as well. Thank you guys for being here as always. Um, love partnering with your practices and, and we're really excited to, to share some more knowledge with you today. Uh, if you're not an OrthoFi or OrthoBank user, that's okay. I mean, this, uh, this is not all tailored you know, for, for our users. Um, you're gonna get a lot out of this. I think you're gonna learn a lot about how you know, your insurance flow works in your practice. And then also maybe learn a couple things about you know, how OrthoFi could, could even help uh, you know, alleviate some of these pains and, and, and do some of these things for you as well and, and be a great partner for your practice. So um, if you guys have any questions uh, for Tina, please use the Q&A function um, in Zoom and, and we're gonna consolidate all the questions. We're gonna ask them to Tina at the end. So uh, we'll make sure to get through all of those. So, so please be you know, uh, in, interactive and engaging. You know, we definitely wanna hear any questions that you have and, and Tina will make sure that we answer those. So. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it off there. Um, you know, it, it, this is my pleasure. We've done a couple of webinars now with Tina. Um, she's the best. You know, those of you that work with her, I know she, a lot of her clients are on here as well. You know, she really is the best in the business. Um, you know, she's considered one of, you know, really the orthodontic industry insurance expert and has gained a lot of success and recognition for uh, her proficiencies in not only clinical, but business and administrative functions. Um, she has extensive knowledge and understanding of the systems um, and efficiency, data analytic, uh, analysis, strategic business planning, and marketing implementation. Uh, she's lectured and, and helped guide the success of some of the leading practices in the country, and um, both large and small, and, and throughout the, the U.S. and abroad. Um, she's a great friend of mine, and, and again, someone that I couldn't be more excited to introduce. Um, she, you know, she offers a unique combination of industry knowledge, humor, wisdom. Uh, every time I talk to her, I'm more motivated than ever. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Tina. And uh, again, thank you all for joining us and uh, hope you enjoy this as much as I know I will. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. Um, we good? Everybody see the presentation? Yes? We're good. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming that's a good a good thing. All righty. Hey, thanks for joining us here on Friday afternoon. Um, I live in the Baltimore, Washington area, and we've got a really nice day weather-wise today, which isn't always the situation this time of year if you live on the East Coast. Um, so I'm going to be happy to step away from my office for a little bit this afternoon. I've been around the industry for more years than I'd really like to tell you, because then you're going to get on your calculator and figure out how old I am. Um, but I will tell you that uh, this year, with the changeover, with the CDT codes, with insurance, has probably been a year where I've had more chatter than anything, and I'm already a little, okay. In terms of offices calling me, um, any of you who are on social media, there's a lot of chatter that goes on. If you're not part of the, the insurance uh, office manager, insurance treatment coordinator, those Facebook pages, there are well-versed team members on there who share good information. Um, you want to be a part of it because this year there is a lot of change happening. So let's talk a little bit about what we've seen this year, whether you're a little familiar with this or whether you're just coming on board and just realizing what's happening. Uh, let's go through where we were, where we're, we're going with this. So January the 1st, there was a change in our CDT codes for submitting our treatments. And the history that we've had was typically full treatment always went in as compre comprehensive orthodontic treatment was usually always submitted with your 70, 80, 90 codes. Um, phase one was our interceptive category for most offices and partial treatment. That's my language, partial treatment. That's typically the way I like to explain how you used a limited code before. OK, before January 1st, 2022. So that's our history. That's the way we know our code submission. So the other thing you that I'm going to address a little bit as we go through this is that 
there is a little bit of crossover with phase one treatment. And at times you will, you went to the D8060 or you went to the D8070. If you're in network, you, you know how that worked for you. So let's talk a little bit about where we were and where we are as of January the 1st, 2022. So now um, the ADA has revamped the descriptors, the description of limited treatment and comprehensive orthodontic treatment. So we no longer have that mid range of 8050 and 8060 CDT codes. So the chatter as this rolled into January of 2022 was where do we go with our interceptive codes that we used before? So what I'd like to do today is just talk a little bit about what we have, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have um, in existing claims that are already out there, what we should probably be doing as we move forward, looking at these two category of treatment codes now, and um, share a little bit of what I've experienced with my offices, what Paula McGinty of OrthoFi has shared with me, who I have tremendous respect for. She's got a lot of knowledge in terms of hundreds and hundreds of practices and claims they see go through on a daily basis with these codes. So in 2022, we had that changeover. Interceptive treatment was now gone. The question is, what do we do with our phase one treatment? So old way, new way. Let's talk first about the active claims, those claims that were most likely submitted with a D8060 and have been adjudicated, payments probably been, been issued to you, your first payment, um, or the treatment start date is prior to January 1st, 2022. What I'm seeing are situations where EOBs are coming back in denials, payments stop, and the big concern has been what's going to happen with our in-network allowances. So I just like to pass along what I feel are probably the things we just have to focus on in terms of being providing solutions to these active claims. And one of them is that most carriers are asking to, for you to resubmit as a work in progress. And I'll show you a little example in a little bit. But as you have a patient who comes into your practice for the very first time and they're in treatment and they've got insurance, you go through the process of a work in progress claim. The same thing, that same concept is what you will likely need to do with your D8060 codes that are already in progress. And the other thing is contacting carriers. I know that that's not the greatest thing in the course of a workday is to sit on the telephone and wait to get through to a carrier and a person on the other end. But I have heard that it's met with great success in terms of contacting your carrier and them guiding through because I really think this rolled out and insurance, the insurance carriers just didn't have, I shouldn't say this, they didn't have enough time to get ready or the pace that they work at, they weren't ready for us come 2022. So many of them were not ready to transfer all these cases over. So therefore, it gives us another step in getting those claims back into their system on a way where we're not seeing benefit payments not coming through. So contacting your carrier is another way of doing it. Um, I should have put on there, and I didn't, that you should really go to your carrier websites because they do. some of them do have information on there about how to process or how they're going to handle this changeover of the CDT codes. The last thing that I'd like to say to you in terms of a solution is appeal any fee adjustments that you see as a result of dropping from an 8060 code to an 8020 code. So in other words, if you're in network, do not, do not accept an adjustment to your fee allowance because the limited code is a lesser code. Appeal that and contact me if you find that going on. Um, there's not a lot of balance sometimes in terms of what carriers are able to do with contracted fees and what we're able to do with contracted fees. But this is something where offices should definitely not find themselves in a situation where they are losing 
any benefits or any allowance to their treatment fee because of this changeover. So that's kind of the way I'd like to just lay that information out there for you and give you a little bit of guidance in terms of one of those. One of those solutions should really get you on board with having your claims turned over. This is an example of a work in progress claim. So in other words, the original claim went in, just like you'd have that work in progress claim that you submit when a patient comes to you in active treatment and you give them the history of when their treatment began and the estimated treatment time and hopefully the fee and any information you have about that, um, as well as the EOBs in terms of payment, which in my opinion, don't need to accompany this work in progress claim. So I typically look at a work in progress claim in two sections, the work in progress, the start of treatment, what it was, what code went in, the banding date, time, treatment fee. And then I typically drop down and I will pick up the dates, as you can see from on the left over here, I will typically pick up the dates that this work in progress claim will cover. So in other words, if this were an 8060 claim, I gave them my interceptive orthodontic treatment information and they should have that on record, but they're telling us, many of them are telling us, a work in progress claim is what's needed. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, get your information in there, drop down, go and put your dates from January the 1st, 2022 through the last month of treatment. And then I usually like to, <clears throat> excuse me, give them the new code, which would be the 8020, the limited code for mixed dentition. And then I always like to include that I'm billing for the D8670 from January 22nd through June of 2022. January 2022 through June of 2022. <clears throat> and then I typically put a note, work in progress claim, please amend the treatment code due to an ADA deletion of code D8020 effective January 1st, 2022. I think if you format something like this, there's no way that they shouldn't have all the information they need or the bureaucracy of changing over your claim. So this is what I'm recommending in terms of your work in progress, a format something like this. If you're lucky enough that these carriers will resolve it with a telephone call, that's fantastic. Um, but don't let it get hung up. Don't go back and forth. If you haven't gotten payment if you've had claims that were interceptive under a D8060 and payment has lapsed or you haven't had payment from the first of the year and the benefit is still active, just submit your work in progress claims. Just get them in there. So when this all rolled around, I think there were a couple reactions. And typically with insurance, I look at two sides of the fence. Offices or doctors that are out of network, in other words, they're not agreeing to any fee allowances. They're billing their own fees. And then the other part of that is contracted doctors. So I think, you know, we were scratching our head as out of network doctors in terms of, okay, what's our changeover going to be? Will that affect us? Probably not. Then you had the in contracted, or excuse me, the contracted in network doctors who were basically, um, in a frenzy and panicking in terms of what's gonna happen with our allowances now that we've lost our mid-level interceptive codes. And this is the reason that most in-network doctors are, it may be unknown. Those offices that are in-network, it may still be unknown what your carriers are going to do with your treatment fees. Um, you'll see that this is an example of United Concordia, I believe, and United Concordia had a $5,800 allowance in this office for all of their comp codes. When we stepped back to an interceptive treatment, it was $2,900, which I would say mid-range interceptive treatment in many offices now can range anywhere from $2,500 to $3,500 or a little more. So if you look at that interceptive code, if you were contracted and you were submitting your records, you probably got the majority of your treatment fee. But here's where the panic comes in. We're taking away those mid-level interceptive treatment codes and now we're dropping back to an 8020, 
with a mixed dentition, an adolescent, I'm sorry, adolescent dentition. Um, and you'll see, according to this fee schedule, we've got an allowance of $1,600, which is very significant. If you haven't um, gathered all your, your fee schedules in terms of your contracted rates, get them together. Now is the time that you absolutely have to bring all your fees together and know basically where you have to go with this. So that's what we're dealing with. That's where we're going in terms of the claims that we have in progress and what we need to look at with those codes. So hopefully everybody has a good handle on that in terms of the changeover. Let's now talk about claims that are effective January 2022 or after. So the new claims. And if we look at the out of network doctor again, little to no concern submitting a D8020. But you have to beware of a benefit that's calculated against an in network UCR. And if you've been part of my full day, seminars or webinars or the lengthier ones, you're probably familiar with what I'm talking about. Basically, you have some carriers where you're out of network, you have the assumption you're going to calculate that patient's entire benefit with the percentage and the maximum allowance against your own fee, and you come up with what you feel is going to be their benefit. And then there's this twist. Your claim goes in and you find out that that particular carrier is using their own quote UCR, which means usual, customary, and reasonable, but they set their own fees. So they're saying, okay, so Dr. Byrne is submitting me a D8070 and Dr. Byrne's fee is $3,900. She's out of network, but our UCR that we're carrying, that, excuse me, that we're using to calculate Dr. Burns' treatment or her benefit for her patient is our number, not her number. And you have to be aware of that because as we drop back to these 80-20s, you could have very low fee UCRs as an out-of-network doctor. So don't think you're skirting everything because you're out of network. There is a little bit of concern that you need to have in terms of what could happen with your benefit calculation and that D8020 code. I always say that when you fix processes um, or problems with your office, it's done at the, at the start of the process, not in the middle or at the end of it. Um, and we're going to cover that. Um, it's it's going to come down to our planning and our preparation for some of these things. So the out-of-network doctors, they thought we thought we had little concern. That's one thing that I'd like to bring up to you right now that you need to look for. If you're in network, what I just said, pull all your fee schedules, your table of allowances together, make sure they're current. It is so common for me to go into an office for the first chance, <clears throat> first time and find that their fee schedules are 10 years old <clears throat> and they've never, never updated their fees, never asked for a fee increase, excuse me, and um, certainly haven't been using the allowance that's probably current. So make sure that you look that you have your fee schedules, make sure that they're current, okay? If not, make sure you're contacting your carrier for increases. And I know over the years that I get feedback that carriers don't release fee schedules. I know it's nuts how they get away with it. I have no idea, but you, some of these you can get online, but you have to do the due diligence at this point in terms of having those numbers on hand because you want to get things on track as best you can with these lower level codes now for your phase one treatment. Go to D8070 versus a D8020. I see a lot of chatter um, on social media, and I get a lot of questions from offices that call me, clients that I work with, you know, which code are we going to? I'm in network with this carrier. The strategy has always been that if you have a phase one, 
it could fall into a D8070 category. In fact, years ago, carriers were, they were prompting you to get on board with them and they would basically tell you that you are allowed a D8070 for a phase one. So the description of a D8070, depending on your treatment and your objectives within those treatment, could qualify for a D8070. So if you're in network and you've never considered that, you need to look at possibility. Is this an option for me? If I'm going to take a huge discount stepping back into a D8020, is that D8070 now an option for me? And what I'd say to you again is we look at full treatment falling into that category of comprehensive codes, partial treatment falling into limited, and Phase one treatment, where do we go with phase one? Let me just see what, there we go. Okay, it could fall either place. The other thing I wanna to bring to your attention is the link, the URL at the top of this sheet right here. The AAO is always very good every year in terms of pulling together an abbreviated code list of the codes we use most frequently. And this is, their, this is their list for 2022. They also have some good information at that site, at that spot, frequent questions um, that are coming up as a result of the, the code changeover and information that everybody should have in their office. I think sometimes we fail to use the AAO as a resource and they've always been there for us. So if you're not the doctor on this, particular webinar, you need to go to your doctor and say, hey, we need to pull this off their website because you're going to need a login. So make sure that you get a screenshot of that URL and go to the website and get their most, inf their most current information. Let's talk a little bit about what I feel are going to be the keys to success in 2022. And it's going to be simple as far as I'm concerned. No surprises. All right, we've got to make sure that we have no surprises. And one is you've got to review your treatments. Okay, review your treatments and make sure that you understand what codes those treatments are going to go into. Interesting enough, if you're an in network provider and you're in network with numerous plans, I have, I have offices I work with that have over 90 plans that they participate with. Um, there are a lot of affiliations nowadays in terms of falling under fee schedules. And I promise you, if you're in network and you're doing it right, you're not submitting the same codes, perhaps to every carrier for the same treatment in your office. You have to go back, you have to review your treatment, you have to review the carriers that you're working with, and you have to align your codes, okay? So have those current in-network fee schedules that I talked about. The other thing is plan, align those treatment codes, and renegotiate if you need to. Um, I've seen notations where offices have gone to carriers and it wasn't time to renegotiate their fees. In other words, if you're in network, you usually have a time frame. You, you can't ask for fee increases within two years of perhaps your contracted date. Um, this is not a fee increase. This is basically a realignment of the codes that the ADA has come up with. So don't take no for an answer in terms of going back and renegotiating in terms of that limited code category and higher allowances if it's very low. I, at the beginning of January, I was one of those emojis that was in a frenzy and a panic about these code changes because first of all i know how things are situated in the offices that i work with and i know that um some of my offices have limited codes where they're not allowed more than perhaps seven or eight hundred dollars for a d8020 code and that's devastating you know, you really you can't do treatment. You, you're losing money doing phase one with an allowance like that. So go to your carriers. Renegotiate probably isn't the best word to use, 
what you need to do is you need to ask them how it is they're going to be managing that if they haven't given you that answer. And if not, you seriously have to look at withdrawing perhaps from some of your carrier participation, especially if you do phase one treatment. It's not uncommon for offices that, that align themselves with early age patients to have phase one treatment be 30 to 35% of the starts they do every month. And if you're in network, we may have to push back on that. Easy to say, um, not so always easy to do, but we've just got to take a little bit of time and work our way through this change for 2022. Comprehensive verification. That's the last thing I want to talk to you about. I said to you, when you fix one of your processes or you find problems that are going on within a process, you're not going to fix it at the point that is happening. You've got to go back to the start of that process. And this is where verification comes into play. Over the past two years, maybe three years, I have realized how detailed some of the offices need to be to have accuracy and pre-crediting benefits for, for in-network patients. And the verification process is becoming more detailed than ever. And again, you can't always online get exactly what you need, the answers to those questions. But having no surprises is going to be a matter of taking care of your verification, getting details, taking your time to get the answers that you need. Now, I may not sit on a telephone call and ask about an 80-20 code if a child is 14 years old. I don't need that with my verification. So take your verification form and give yourself some internal notes that say, refer to the age of the patient. Do I need to ask those questions? But I believe that we have to look at, first of all, the 80-20 code. Are there benefits under that plan? Are they allowed? Because over the years, I have seen patients come into offices and they would not allow a D8020 code. So that is extremely problematic. And where do we go with that? Especially if we can't go to a phase one with an 8070. The other thing is look at if, are there any other exclusions under that D8020 code? Do they require it to be 12 months of treatment? Do they require it, you know, any kind of a time frame for that, any other exclusions that we need to know. You've got to know this at verification because this is not on a carrier level. This very often could be on an employer level, okay? So you can't say that, hey, guardian never pays for an 80-20. Maybe guardian does. Um, but you have to say, this is the employer and what does that employer's plan look like? It's not about the carrier, it's about the employer plan. That's the level of your exclusions and your limitations. D8070, a lot of chatter about limit on comprehensive codes. I have been doing this for a very long time and I have been crossing over into D8070 for phase ones for a very long time. And I can tell you that there is a very, very small percentage of treatments that I've seen in the offices I work with who limit comprehensive codes. In other words, you've got to say, if I submit phase one under a D8070, can I then turn around and go to a D8080 for my, excuse me, for my phase two treatment? Is there a limit with that particular plan, not the carrier, the plan, but it could be common among carriers. I think I, I saw something about Delta of Illinois maybe, might be a carrier that, that's very common with that. Um, you have to ask. The other thing you have to look at again is, if this patient has a thousand dollar benefit and I'm submitting a D8070 and I submit that because I'm in network, and the D8020 has a very low allowance that I can't do treatment for, for that fee. So if there is a limit on a comprehensive code for D8070 and the patient has a $1,000 benefit 
and you're using it all, you're using their entire benefit. The other thing I would say to you is, who knows if they're going to have that benefit down the road? Um, use benefits when you have them. On occasion, <clears throat> I get feedback from an office that someone doesn't want to use their benefits. Um, that's crazy. You need to advise your patients to use their benefits when they have them. You never know what's going to change. So that's the thing that we need to look for on the 8070. Is there a limit on comprehensive codes? Out of network providers, you've got to start asking how your benefit is calculated. If you're out of network, are you using my fee to calculate the patient's benefit? Or are you using the carrier UCR to calculate the benefit? This has been going on long before January 2022, and we've had this changeover of the codes. Um, it, it's a question that we're finding in offices because we get to the end of treatment and the plan is paid out, and I haven't gotten all the benefit I pre-credited, nothing that I thought I was gonna get. It's because we didn't realize they were using not our fee, but their own fee to calculate that benefit. That's a biggie, and it's becoming more and more common with carriers. You have to realize, and I always say this, insurance is a business. It's not about healthcare, and it's not about helping people. It's a business, and there are a lot of reasons that these, these rules and exclusions come into play, you know, and part of it, it's business strategy, it's selling plans and paying less than they need to. So these are the things that I think you have to look at very carefully. You have to dive deeper into your verification, your eligibility and the plan information. I have to thank OrthoFi and OrthoBank for pulling these webinars together because I believe education on insurance is so long overdue. We should have had it many years ago. Um, I'm one person, we're, we're definitely working to get more information out there, you know. Um, so I want to take a little bit of time and say kudos to OrthoFi for the program that you've had and the changes that you're working on, knowing all these things are happening right now in the insurance industry. So if we look at OrthoFi a little bit, you know, their process in terms of eligibility at the front, there's nearly 40 data points that they are getting in terms of a patient's benefits, okay? And their software is designed to be the brain in terms of thinking that. So if you're doing this in office, you have got to realize we got to step up our verification. The other thing that I want to take you through is, um, let's see if there's anything on here that we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Financial before. Okay, the cheat sheet. Again, I think that the prompt verification OrthoFi has for a patient's benefit reduces the amount of errors that we're going to make there. So look into their system if you have to. If you have a problem, I will tell you for many, many years, I've been a consultant who's worked in office. There was a period of time when OrthoFi was around that patients, or excuse me, practices would call me. And my first thought was not to refer practices to OrthoFi, but to get a system internally. We all know how staffing situations are dogging us right now. And for those offices that have may never considered outsourcing certain things, if you are losing money in that area of your practice, you have got to think, does it make sense for me to outsource some things? Um, the other thing that I really should have looked at these slides closely, but the other thing that I will say is I've, it's, I've been fortunate to be working with OrthoFi and OrthoBank over the past year or so and working on how we as offices can maximize our processes for being in network and the codes that we can submit because you miss it. I have found literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that an office misses when they're submitting their claims and they're in network with those carriers because they don't realize what they can submit. They're not unbundling their treatment to come together in terms of what combination of codes gives me the greatest allowance. Again, 
OrthoFi software, I'm so excited to say that before long, we're gonna have a nice automated solution where we can bring together those things for offices very easily. So again, OrthoFi, um, I have to give it to you in terms of thank you for sponsoring me, coming together for any kind of office, whether they're an OrthoFi office, an OrthoBank office, or whether they have never looked at your, your services and, and have no interest in your services. So a little bit of information here about your OrthoFi in terms of how they can help you navigate through this whole process of code changes. All right, I, again, I just wanna give you a screenshot of what it is you're gonna see, how it pulls that together in terms of all your information in one area. And obviously you know that they submit claims for you as well. Um, they're working to, enhance their processes and um, fill in the, the areas that we have trouble in an office with multiple claims, different codes, multiple, multiple codes in, in network, all those kinds of things. Um, I wanna take one minute at this point and ask Paula McGinty if there's anything she'd like to add to the whole changeover of D8020 from 8070 since the first of the year, because again, Paula is fortunate enough to be in the view of hundreds of claims a day. Hey, Paula, how are you, doll? Hi, Pina. Um, thanks for the intro. Oh, you're <laughs> welcome. You. Um, you know, we've been really actually surprised how smooth most carriers have handled this change. So we haven't seen a lot of need to resubmit claims awesome. that were submitted prior to the first of the year. OrthoFi users, your default settings were automatically updated for you, so you don't need to worry about picking a code and it being inactive. So um, we, if you have questions about what default codes you have in there, reach out to your Ortho Success Managers and you'll have a chat with a member of my team and we'll make sure you're in the know. Awesome. So you are seeing carriers transition over to the new code without too much we problem. Are. I think you mentioned are. Cigna. Seen, to Cigna me. Sometimes they need a phone call. So if you have an 80, 50, 80, 60 claim that was started before the first of the year um, and they're not continuing to pay you, please give them a call. Or if you're an OrthoFi user, we've taken care of that for you um, because they do need a push. They need that push to make sure that you're still getting paid. Um, we've also seen some good momentum with some contracted rates being updated. Awesome. Um, some pretty big network networks, Dentamax reshuffled their fees. So um, if you haven't got your 2022 Dentamax rates from them, they are easy to get on their website. And they that will make a big difference. You'll be, we'll be pleasantly surprised there. Okay. Thank you. That's great to hear that some of these larger carriers or networks are on top of it um, because we all know insurance coordinators hate to follow up on claims that are not being paid and it dogs us to be sitting on telephone calls nowadays so thanks paula anything else that you feel we could be giving out today not that can come into mind okay Good great stuff here. well thanks much thanks. okay thanks tina you're welcome so before we leave today, and we have a little bit of time for questions, so hopefully maybe you've been submitting your questions to Brian and um, we're able to give you a few answers or help you solve a few problems. Um, I just want to say that if you haven't seen the full day insurance masterclass that we're going to be doing, it's coming up in April in Scottsdale. And there's so many layers to insurance that you peel back, whether you're out of network, whether you're in network, things that are happening with insurance affect us either way, no matter which side of the fence we sit on. So OrthoFi, we did this in November. We're doing it again in Scottsdale in April, should be beautiful weather. And there is an abundance of insurance information that you can take away from this particular presentation. So here's the information. Um, if you want the QR code or you can always email OrthoFi or go to 
their website or Facebook, social media, whatever, for information. So let's just put that out there for everybody to know that there's more information to come. And I'm going to open it up to questions, Brian, if we have anyone who's submitted anything. Yeah, we are getting hammered with questions, which is <laughs> awesome. Um, love to see everybody being so engaged here. So we'll start chipping through these and uh, keep them coming in as we go through if, if we don't get to yours. So um, the first one um, is from Lydia Samala from Ask Orthodontics. And, and she would like to know how to manage insurance in cases where the patient gets insurance mid-treatment or near the end of treatment and wants to use their coverage. Okay, not not a one a one thing answer in terms of that. Um, it happens a lot. We know that plans do not stay into effect very long, maybe a couple years. Um, we have one rule in my offices, and that is don't adjust your contract. If you have a patient who comes mid treatment, or especially in the later part of treatment and they have benefits, if there's a changeover from another benefit, take whatever might be on that ledger that's left from that, move it to the new one, but remain with your contract on hand. Um, I always like to say to a patient, we would never want to mislead you in terms of what we expect. And when insurance happens, once you're in treatment, there are so many twists and turns that can happen. So what we like to do is submit and we'll see exactly what it is that you'll have with this new benefit. And then we can work with you to make any changes that have to happen accordingly. So that's typically the way I handle it. Status quo, get your new insurance submitted and underhand and then see where you go with it. Um, the next one here is from Christina Dragstrom at Petty and Dragstrom Orthodontics. Uh, what happens when using 8070 uh, if the insurance carrier won't allow a second submission for comprehensive treatment like 8080? They aren't upfront about that when we verify benefits. Um, if there's an exclusion for it, they need to be upfront with you about it. You know, something that I should have put in this slide that I didn't is when you're getting insurance information, make sure that you're asking for the person you're speaking with and you're asking for a reference number to your call, okay? If you're misled or you're asking questions that they don't have answers to, you have a solid case for appealing anything that happens with those claims. So again, my rule of thumb is you have to look at your treatment. You have to look at each carrier. You know, I may be able to go with an 80-20 to MetLife, but then I step over to perhaps United Healthcare, and that same treatment in my office may need to go in as an 8070. So you do your homework, and then again, step back to the verification process, make sure that you have some kind of a cheat sheet or something that's guiding you in terms of carriers if you need to look and ask if they have exclusions for that. And again, I correct myself, not carriers, plans, okay? unless you've realized that there is a carrier that it's common with common knowledge that that's what they do. Um, this one is from Sandy Archer at Orthodontics Limited. Uh, I just tried to go to D8070 with Aetna DHA. They told me they will not consider two comprehensive codes. The patient has no lifetime max, therefore we don't want to take the chance of billing D8070 and then be denied D8080 when the patient is ready. We are in network with DHA for Aetna in Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, um, yes, that's exactly why you got to verify it at the start because you will find some plans that will not allow you to go with two comprehensive codes. And again, uh, you know, I'm looking at things. How, <clears throat> how much is that benefit? You mentioned that they have no limit. I, that's usually a flag for me when there's no limit on an orthodontic benefit. That usually tells me to ask and dig if there's any kind of medical component to it. Is it medically necessary? Okay, because that's one of the things that will come up frequently with an orthodontic benefit that's either sits under the medical or it's medically necessary under dental. So yeah, in, in that situation, you you have to look, you know, if, if I'm not going to use all their treat, all their benefit, 
Um, I'm gonna, I have no choice but to go with the lower code, the, the limited code. Um, and I've actually seen offices where, and I wouldn't advise this, but doctors won't start their treatment right then. But I don't think that's the right thing to do with the patient. I think you have to do what's right by the patient. And if those are the situations, um, take them to your doctor, let them know what's happening with that Aetna plan, and then do your research in terms of, hey, what happens if we step away from that? Yeah, this, this question is you know, the whole D8070 D8, versus D8080 question is, is popping up a lot in this. So yeah. you know, I just, just for clarification, I guess I want to make sure everybody understands it. If using or billing out with D8070 for phase one, there's kind of two questions here, like for phase one, does it affect using D80 for phase two or does it eliminate, does it eliminate the ability to bill for phase two? You don't know unless you ask. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, from, okay, so this one is from Lindsay Francis uh, from My Orthos. Um, from what I've been told, when we file claims electronically, all the notes need to be put in the remarks section and not in the description because insurance does not want to read it um, because it doesn't go through electronically. Um, is that true? Do you have any advice there? I tell my offices that when they have a claim that's out of the normal realm of a simple situation, um, either look to fax it in or mail it in as well as your electronic submission, but get it over that way. And that's the advice that I've used in my office for a very long time. I, I don't get a lot of feedback, you know, that, that it's a problem. Um, this one is from uh, Hengami, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Karkaneki. Um, but love your webinars. Thank you for Delta specifically um, does not negotiate. What codes do you recommend for Delta in California? Oh, Delta of California, you guys, you guys are, are special. Um, you know, they always have things going on in California that isn't. Um, again, I think you'd have to look at your treatment. You'd have to look at what it is you're allowed. You have to go to your verification. Um, Delta is a tough one because, you know, it was a plan. Uh, it was a carrier that so many doctors have been in for a very long time. Um, yes, they're not going anywhere with their fees. Premier is going away. Um, I was told not too long ago by someone within Delta that I had called um, to discuss some things with Premier versus the PPO plans is that Delta isn't even going to be offering many Premier plans. Most of them are going to be going to PPO plans. So not getting too far away from your question. Um, you have to look, you have to know in terms of if you have restrictions for submitting that second diagnostic code, that second comprehensive code, um, you've got to make a decision. You know, what are you going to do with the lower level code? One other thing that I just want to mention, um, I saw some chatter on social media about offices who may be submitting D8090 after a D8070. Listen, um, there are gray areas in ortho, but my initial thought was that's a comprehensive code. So if you can't submit a D8080, I'm not sure that you can submit a D89 because they all fall in that comprehensive code category. Um, let's see, this one is from Marita uh, Rigalizzo from KDAR Orthodontics, um, OrthoFi user, shout out to Marita. Um, I've noticed Delta Dental, uh, Delta Dental particularly asking for screenshots of treatment cards for work in progress claims. Um, are you aware of this and is there any recourse? Um, you know, I've heard it not a lot, but I have heard that they're asking, you know, for treatment notes, screenshots. Interesting. Um, well, I guess, you know, if you don't have the ability to print your electronic card, um, I have heard it. Again, the patient signs off for you to release information to their insurance carrier when you get those signatures on file and make sure you're getting those signatures on file. Um, when we went paperless and we went to electronic claims and we're doing a lot of things, I see a lot of offices that have no signature on file for insurance. A, you have that you have authorization to release their information and B, that you have 
they give you authorization for payment to come to you. So if that's the case, especially if you're releasing more and more treatment information, make sure you have their signature on file. All right. Um, okay, so this is from Sandy Archer, again, from uh, Orthodontics Limited. Um, so she says, we have 11 patients that have started D8020 with an, with an allowance we just discovered is $461 for Aetna DHA. I'm at, a loss out of, I'm at a loss out of handle this. I've received out, uh, or I've reached out to DHA to update the code allowance. Still waiting to hear back. These treatments are all intercepted or uh, intercepted with RPE and upper and lower anterior brackets, 12 month treatment time. Yeah, that that's exactly um, the nightmare situation, you know, that in-network doctors have to think about. You cannot treat a phase one treatment with any kind of brackets and wires um, or even any kind of a fixed appliance for that matter for 400 and some dollars. Um, I would appeal, um, I would definitely appeal those particular claims and refer to the D80 seven, excuse me, D8060 code allowance um, and the changeover. I'm going to make myself a note. Um, I, I haven't found any information in terms of appealing these claims, but um, take my, take my um, email address that you see on the screen there and give me feedback, please, about some of these things that you're seeing that comes in from these D8020 submissions because I really would love for us to have some advocacy in terms of approaching carriers um, about that D8020 allowance. But I would appeal it and I would strongly appeal it stating that you treated these cases based on the fact that they were interceptive um, and we know that they haven't you know, a lot of systems have not been updated yet to consider that and ask them to pay according to your allowance for your 80, 80 60. That's what I would do. Um, doesn't hurt to ask. Um, this one is from Jennifer Stout with Smile Doctors. Has anyone had success with Aetna negotiations to raise their D8020 rate to match D8030 or D8040? Um, well, D80, 20, 30, and 40 in many carriers is the same fee, I see anyway. Um, there are a few where, you know, each individual one, you know, they nickel and dime me with a few dollars here and there. Uh, Paula mentioned that she is seeing carriers step up and giving those same allowances they gave for the 50 and 60 code, stepping it back, you know, giving it to the codes, the limited codes. Um, United Concordia is a big one. I saw them take their $1,600 allowance. Maybe Paula was the one who sent me this. Um, and $2,900 was their allowance for their mid-level interceptive. And they bumped that code into the 80-20. So yes, we are seeing it. You know, insurance carriers are just so behind in terms of anything that happens um, with them. But I, I really think that um, I'd love to hear what you're getting with your 8020s and you know uh they should know you know the aao and the ada should really kind of know what's happening as a result of these changes um let's see here um uh what would you what would be your rec this one is from uh let's see i think it's an anonymous one but what, what would be your recommendation on how many people should be specifically working on insurance claims and credentialing for a practice that has six office locations, four offices seeing roughly 60 to 80, 60 to 80 patients a day, one office seeing about 90 to 100 a day, um, including Medicaid billing, one office brand new, and a new uh, patient and, and a few patients a month. <laughs> well, I'm assuming that there aren't enough or I wouldn't be asked that question, right? Um, Listen, take my email and shoot me an email and I'll arrange to connect with you. And you can kind of tell me your situations and I can give you my thoughts on it. When it comes to credentialing um, and negotiating fees, I have to tell you, I am a Five Lakes Pro fan. Um, they, 
the offices that they negotiate and contract with that I work with are the highest allowances that I see anywhere. Um, but whoever sent you that question, Brian, please take my email address, email me, and I'll, I'll be happy to do some one-on-one -on -one phone time with you. Absolutely. Um, this one is from uh, Christine DeMarty at CD Orthodontics. If we are in network and bill a phase one as a, as a D8070, can we bill it for less than the insurance contracted rate? My phase one fee isn't as high as the contracted rate for the D8070 code. Absolutely, positively. In fact, you don't want to change your fee. You don't want to increase your fee just because the carrier allows more. Um, you want, you know, ideally, you don't want to reduce it. That's what you don't want to do. So um, you always submit your fee, always submit your office fee in terms of that and know that with that particular carrier, you have wiggle room. You know, if you have to do a fee increase, you know that you have a little bit of wiggle room with that particular code with that carrier. Um, let's see. Uh... This one is from Sue Nicoletti at Minetti Orthodontics. Other than sending a prior authorization, how can an out-of-network office get the UCR fee schedule? I don't have an answer for that. Was it Sue that, that asked that question? Did you say Sue? Yes. Okay. I don't have an answer for that question. Um, and pre-auth is like really the only thing. The offices that I work with, um, it we learn by what's come back to us. Um, and that's really the only way of knowing. I think maybe once you get a few patients through, if it's a common carrier, you know, you know what that is and keep records accordingly, but they won't release it. Um, again, I, I don't feel that that's something that they should be able to get away with, but that they don't release it. And yeah, so it, it's been a problem for offices. One of those, I can't believe they, they're allowed to do that thing for me. Um, this one is from Yolanda Elmore. Um, or Elmore, am I pronouncing that wrong? Um, I work with Medicaid, the state insurance. We use we used to use D8060 for limited treatment, which is mostly partial braces. Can I mostly partial braces? Can I use D8070 for the partial braces and tra transition to D8080 for full treatment? You know, that same answer. You've got to check with your verification. Um, it, whether you can or not. I'm certain insurance can have different trends across the country. You know, I definitely see different trends on the West Coast than I do the East Coast. Um, Midwest seems to have the best of everything, to be honest with you. Um, but you have to basically check to see if you can do it with that plan. And there's not a yes or no across the board. There, Maybe sometimes you'll be able to do it. Maybe sometimes you won't be able to do it. And this is where I think this whole change that's happening in 2022, so many offices are going to need to revisit their system in terms of how they do things because you don't have the answer to those questions. It's, it's preparation. Um, this one is from Patricia McKelvey from North Valley Orthodontics. For a limited treatment, is there any is there a specific amount of time it has to be? Delta told me if I do D8030, it is for six months. Do you know if there do you know if that if this is the same for all insurances? Specifically, if the interceptive treatment is RPE, uh, we do this first um, in parentheses, but uh, then we layer in doing upper two by four. Can I build two separate D8020 treatments as each part uh, starts? If that's if that's the trend your office has, I think you have you have to sit down very carefully and look at your codes and your treatment modalities. Um, again, a duplicate code, whether it's comprehensive or limited, you'd have to ask upon you know about that. And if that's your particular doctor's method of treating phase one, I think you need to get an answer for that. I think it needs to be a common question in your verification. Um, I will say that um, more offices are putting their own time frames on plans for phase one and full treatment. Uh, but yet it's interesting that we're penalized sometimes if, you know, if we don't get paid, if it's 14 months versus 24 months, sometimes the benefits are cut short. Um, so I would say 
look at that. The one thing I will caution you is that a code, a D8010 to a D8090, those particular codes require treatment time. How much treatment time? I have seen some offices be able to step into D8022, okay, at the start for something. Um, so that could always be an option for you if there's a specific appliance that you're working with before you step into another phase of phase one. So you could have you could have a true limited and then a phase one and a phase two. Um, again, look at your treatment, see how it breaks up and what your possibilities are for your coding. All right. Um, this one is from uh, Amy George it's at Struck Off Orthodontics. What is the best method for verification? The carrier website, fax, or call? Most carrier websites and fax, uh, fax do not include exclusions, allowable fees, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I, I'm advising more and more offices to dive deeper into verification, but you also have to think, like, be smart about it. You know, don't get on the telephone about certain things if it's a young age child and you don't need to know about those D8080 codes. But the answer to your question is this. I've always said to my offices, get whatever you can in carrier language, okay? So in other words, get the facts, get the online from the online portal, download whatever it is that they're giving you. And then if you're dogged with some of these problems, you have no choice but to phone in for your verifications, keep good records about plans if they're very common in your office. Um, you know, other than that, pre-authorizations are the only thing and, and they don't guarantee you everything. You know, they, they say that they're never a guarantee of things. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we know this is uh, challenging. I mean, this is a ton of questions that continue to come in. So thank you everybody for being super engaged. Remember, Orthofy is also here to help. I mean, this is a, a big challenge for practice. A lot of reasons why practices look at Orthofy. So, you know, shameless plug myself there. Uh, this is something you, you want to learn how we might be able to help you. Uh, you know, please let us know. We'd love to you know talk with you about your specific case. Um, Come to see. Scottsdale. Come to Scottsdale. We'll talk more about that in a little bit um, for sure. So we'll try to be your uh, respectful time. If, you know, if you're doing okay, we'll cut, try to keep hammering through some of these. Um, there's a couple more, but sure. um, this one's from, uh, uh, let's see, Kim and at Craig Davis Orthodontics. Uh, hi, I was wondering what to do if you already have done interceptive treatment under a DD20 and now need a, a phase 1B and need to bill a D8020 again, Delta of California. Interesting, interesting. Um, I would probably bill it with your 8020. You have no choice but to do that. And I would probably ask that they forego any kind of exclusion on that code as a result of the ADA changes in January 2022. That's what that's how I would do it. And again, you know, you might want to verify the plan, see if there is any kind of limitation on it. If there is, I would appeal at the start of that claim that they allow the D8020 code. All right, let's see. Um, this one is from uh, Sharice Davis at Brandon Lane Orthodontics. Uh, one of the deltas, can't re recall exactly which state, but denied D8090 because patient was 13. I called and was told in February that the D8070, D8080, D8090 are now age uh, related. D87, yeah, so then D8070, six to nine years old, D8080, 10 to 13 years old, D8090, 14 uh, plus. Have you heard this? I haven't heard it, but let me tell you this. Um, we assume that when a patient becomes 18, they're an adult. OK, and I have seen offices that they have submitted 16 and 17 year olds as an adult, adult an 80, 90. If you read the CDT codes, they are about dentition and the D8090 is about growth cessation. OK, the patient has stopped growth, which means that a patient could be a D8080 into their 20s because they're still growing. Um, I feel that that particular carrier, I would challenge them. I would take 
it to the ABA and I would definitely take it to the insurance coordinator or, or excuse me, your insurance commissioner in terms of this carrier putting age restrictions on something that totally contradicts what we do with our CDT codes. Um, this one is from- Can I just uh, say one other, can I just say one other thing, Brian? About yep. that particular question, you know, we, we as an office and insurance coordinators in terms of benefits, we think that these battles are all our own. And I've always said to my offices, don't own your benefits for your patients. When you have these tough situations, take it to the patient, you know, the parent, the subscriber, let them know what it is you're up against and what their carrier is crazily telling you that you can't do or the age specifics and have them go to their HR or subscriber services about it. OK, so sometimes we might need to help them put something together in terms of appealing something. That's what I want to say. Excellent. Um, do you recommend billing under D8020 for appliances separately needed through treatment for phase one or strictly under D8020? You know, it depends. When I look at like multiple codes or multiple stages or phases of treatment, I, I just saw the screen change. I'm not sure about what might have happened, Brian. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, okay. Um, I always look at the treatment, the, the doctor's treatment in terms of how it is. I just, I do not group codes together unless I have an opportunity to look at the doctor's treatments. Um, so what do I use? It, it depends. It depends on the networks they're in. It depends on their treatment. It depends on their objectives with appliances, the length of time with appliances. It really does depend. I, and again, you, if you have my email, feel free to email me and explain your situation. And I could maybe help you out in terms of giving you a little guidance. Awesome. And we're going to keep going. I just, I know, you I mean, we were a little bit over. So again, I wanted to just promote a couple of things real quick. We'll keep going through these questions if it's okay with you, Tina, but I wanted to just try okay. to respect everybody's time. And again, we have this uh, awesome masterclass, you know, space is limited. This isn't, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're not, this isn't a 500 person course. So it's, it's, you know, we try to do these very specifically where they're big enough, where we have a great crowd and get a lot of different opinions and questions from all across the country to, to let really everybody learn, but also have it kind of be kind of an intimate environment uh, where, where you get some really good time with, with Tina. Um, you know, it's a pretty comprehensive course. So uh, again, you can, you can scan that QR code uh, to go to the registration page. Um, if you use the promo code earlybird30, you'll get $30 off your registration. Um, so again, we'd love to see you guys there and we're gonna cover a lot of stuff um, on here as well. And, um, you know, again, if, uh, you know, this is a headache, right? If you're interested in learning more about how ortho can help you, um, you know, there's, there's really never been a really better time to look at this. We're in a lot of great promos right now, um, specifically for these people, for all of you guys that are on the webinar, for participating with us today. Um, if you complete a complete a demo uh, before March 31st, um, you and end up signing up, up with OrthoFi, you receive $2,000 off your setup fee. And we're also doing kind of a, a even kicker here that's you know pretty pretty big. But the first three practices you know from this webinar that sign up um, will receive free implementation, which is you know over $8,100 value. You get two free tablets for your practice for uh, our OrthoFi's Open Choice Payment Slider. Um, again, TC, it's a really the tool for the TCs to use. So you can scan that code to schedule a demo, um, visit, visit us at startmoresmiles.com. Um, again, we'll keep hammering through some of these questions, but wanted to make sure to show both of those uh, opportunities for practices to, to engage with the, obviously the, the masterclass in Arizona. Um, I don't know about where everybody lives in Colorado. It's nice today, but we had like, you know, put a snow the other day. So I personally can't wait to go out to Arizona, um, get some sunshine in there, but um, Let's see, I will keep hammering away here at, at some more questions. So um, can appeals be submitted electronically or only by mail? Any, any recommendations on writing appeals? This one's from Janelle Horst at Valley Orthodontic Group. Ask me that, ask me that question again. I was reading something and I missed the first part. Yeah, can, can appeals be submitted electronically or only by mail? Any recommendations on writing appeals? 
I don't know the answer to that question, but um, I'm assuming that the clearinghouse, um, they're looking for claims. So I think you'd have to look at your clearinghouse. You'd have to go online to whomever it is you're using, dental exchange or whoever it might be, um, and see if they have something that would be an appeal form on there. Um, many of the carriers do have information on their websites about how to do appeals. So that's the other place that I would go. I would check those two places because I don't have the answer to that. And it, it could be, it could very well be different from carrier to carrier. Um, this one is from Tracy uh, Skoke, Skoch. I'm sorry, I know I'm terrible at pronouncing some of these names. Um, at uh, Kimmy Castle Orthodontics. Uh, thank you for the webinar. I am curious, uh, what do you think about splitting up the phase one fee and billing the insurance twice? If phase one, um, I bill phase one using code DD20 for a portion of the fee for six months, and then I bill DD30 for the remainder of the fee for the remaining six months. Um, send me an email, please. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about your treatment. That's not something that I usually recommend. Um, and I'm kind of surprised, um, depending on how you place brackets, a start of a case is a placement of appliances. So I think you have to look sometimes at what it is you're placing within any of those codes, those treatment codes. Um, but to split the phase one into two thing, two limited codes is not anything I've ever done in any of my offices, but you could have a treatment that's out of the norm in terms of the way you handle it. Um, I will caution you this. Uh, I think that we've, what do you call it when you wake the sleeping giant or something like that? Um, that phrase, I'm terrible with, with those kind of things. Um, I think we've called a lot of attention to our codes now this year when it comes to the insurance carriers. Um, you know, I'm a strong proponent of the three categories that we had before. Um, I think that now we are asking them to look more closely at what we submit to them. And, you know, it, it could have far reaching effects on our submissions that that we're just not thinking about here. Um, so email me with your situation of the 8020 and the 8030 code, and hopefully um, I'll try to connect with you and get a little more info and talk to you about it. Perfect. Um, let's see here. Uh, when th this is from uh, uh, Candace Hawk at uh, Oxford Orthodontics. When when there's a dual insurance, do you send both claims at the start of treatment or wait until primary uh, EOB is received before uh, sending to secondary? Come to Scottsdale. <laughs> um, you're talking about coordination of benefits here. And, you know, again, it looks if if your secondary insurance doesn't do any kind of coordination, you know, they're submitting standard, which means they don't care what the first pays. Yeah, absolutely. Submit both of them at once. I've seen um, a lot of chatter about a lot of offices who just send them both off at one time. Um, and if there's coordination, the second one comes back to you and you know that there's coordination. Um, it, I don't think it matters that you do um, other than what happens if it comes back is the subscriber gets a denial saying that they won't pay it. And that usually the phone rings for you, you know, and you have to explain it to the, uh, the other side of the party. So um, depends on what works best for your office. I've seen it done both ways. I think anything that's efficient and you can get it done, you know, and let that works for you. Yeah, um, absolutely. If I were still in an office, um, I would make sure that I get my information for what kind of coordination they do. And if it's standard, I'd send them both off without doubt. Um, and then I'd make a decision that if they coordinate, um, am I going to send them both at one time or whatever? It is nice to have the same process across the board, you know, no matter what the variables may be. So um, good question. And yeah, I'd, pro I'd probably send them all at once. Uh, this one's from Rachel Sherlin at Webb Family Orthodontics. Uh, we have contacted uh, TenCare of Tennessee, and they cannot answer what ADA code they are replacing D8060 with for patient previously approved for D8060. 
any advice there on how to navigate that? Well, that's interesting because the D8060 um, is based on dentition and the limited code reads the same dentition. The D8020 reads the same, same dentition description that you have for the D8060. So if it's the code in terms of the CDT code, I, I don't know why they wouldn't be able to figure that out. Um, the fee, that's probably what they can't figure out. They can't figure out what they're going to allow based on the fee for that D8020 code. That's my thought about that question. Um, let's see. Um, how This one is from Tracy Gleason at Shaw Orthodontics. How about submitting retention codes? Can these be submitted with the D8080, D8090 codes using the same date? Um, reten uh, you know, that question, I could interpret that question a number of different ways. Um, the, the phase of retention itself, insurance doesn't pay for retention. Retention is typically considered part of a comprehensive treatment or a treatment plan. Um, retainers very often are not paid for, but you have exceptions. They are. So, I would never submit retention under a D8080 or a D8090. Um, and maybe you're, maybe we're just using the, the term loosely in terms of treating a patient with retainers. Um, and if there's movement and you have an objective, um, you know, then, then you could. Feel free to email me um, more details about that question in terms of the retention that you're submitting. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, would we be able to find out if we use D8070 for phase one and then bill for D8020 for phase two? Will they still pay the initial payment or, ins or insurance might not pay initial uh, banding payment as they would have paid on the D8070 claim? Read that to me again. Sorry, I'm trying to read through it as well. Would we be able to find out if we, um, would we be able to find out that if we use D8070 for phase one and then bill for D8080 for phase two? Oh, will they 80, still, 80. Yeah, D8080 for phase two. Will they still pay an initial payment or insurance might not pay initial banding payment as they would have paid on that D8070 claim? I don't think an initial payment comes into play. If you're able to submit two comprehensive, two comprehensive codes under two different, <clears throat> excuse me, under two different um, treatments, they should pay an initial and ongoing payments for each particular case. And I don't think an, I've never seen that happen. I've never seen an 8070 affect the fact that you won't get an initial for a D8080. And I saw somebody um, just pop up in a comment that they submitted replacement retainers um, to somebody and they got it paid. Like I said, um, it's been a history that they didn't pay for retainers, but more and more things are, you know, coming, coming around differently. And I never not submit for retainers if a patient wants us to submit to retainers for retainers, replacement retainers, um, always customer service wise, you would submit. The retention in terms of submitting retention is 80 or 90. I, I didn't quite understand that question. Um, yeah, so that one's from Shay. Uh, again, we can you know, uh, follow up uh, as well. Uh, we'll make sure to, to provide a list of all these questions uh, uh, to Tina after the webinar. So, um, and we'll, when we follow up with the recording, we'll make sure to share uh, Tina's email address. So if anybody has questions, again, that they want to follow up with directly, if, if you're okay with that, Tina. Um, this one is from Tracy Katz. Uh, hello, and thank you for your time. Um, you are saying, just this is kind of a clarification, you are saying that you would not recommend billing for D8021 uh, first, uh, six months of treatment for phase one, and then bill for or I'm sorry, um, 
you're saying that you would not recommend billing for D8221, six months of treatment for phase one, and then bill for D8020 for remaining six months or actually the entire 12 months? Can you explain why you would not recommend? To me, they are two different I don't, things. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the treatment. I don't know what you're doing. A D8220 is an appliance, okay? It's a singular appliance, okay? Um, and it all depends on the way the doctor's treating. So very often I have offices when I know the way they treat, if they have a standalone appliance and it's going in and you have an objecting, objective being accomplished by that, it could qualify for a D8220. You know, and then you could go into another phase of treatment. Here's what I, what I'd like to caution everybody is, you know, sometimes you've got to submit what falls within the guidelines of the codes and the descriptors of the codes, um, because if you're ever questioned or audited, God forbid, they could go back through your treatments in terms of the way you submitted codes and they could withdraw a lot of benefits. Um, and you could step back in terms of having to maybe discount things. But when it comes to that 8220 or that, and then followed by an 8020, um, I think maybe things could be lost in translation here between questions Brian gets and, and posed to me. And I'm happy, email me anything very specific, and I'm happy to connect with you and get clarification and tell you exactly what I, what I would do. Um, what code was used for replacement retainers? That's one of our biggest challenges. You know, um, off the top of my head, I'd have to go to my CDT book because the, I think codes have changed. Um, and I'd have to look that up, honestly, because I, I'm, Right now, I can't remember what they've changed about that. But there, there are codes. If you don't have a current CDT book or even that um, at a glance, the AAO, go to the AAO and get their CDT at a glance, the 2022. It's going to give you all those codes and they do list anything ortho specific on that, on that list. Um. There you go. Somebody said it's 8692. Thank you. Yep. And somebody said there's two codes for each arch. Yep. Maxillary and mandibular. <laughs> um, and you can Google it. <laughs> right. One of my favorite things. One of my favorite answers always. Hey, Brian, I always say none of us is as smart as all of us. <laughs> I love that. I love that statement. Um, last one here. Um, would, would billing out the records, appliance, and retention be a workaround to the fee schedule issues mentioned earlier? Unbundling treatment if you're in network based on the, on the carrier and what you're allowed to do, absolutely it's a workaround. But if you're not doing it, you need to consider it. Um, I've done it for years. Um, come together with OrthoFi. There's been a lot of chatters, some exciting things on the horizon in terms of that. Um, and, but yeah, absolutely. If you're in network, you have to look at your carriers individually and you have to unbundle your fees. And sometimes you have to communicate with patients a little differently in terms of what you offer at no cost at your initial exam. Um, one more here. You, you talked about, um, you recommend, uh, one of the questions around who you recommend to help with fee negotiations. I know you have a great partnership with uh, Five Lakes. Um, Cindy Miller is asking, you know, uh, do you have a contact for Five Lakes? She's Google it, but there's a lot of, there's many options. Do you, is there someone specific or an email address, do you know, that to reach out to there? Um, FiveLakesPro.com. Um, I don't have a partnership, but, <clears throat> but I give their name out and that's not something I do very often, but, um, they can do things that I can't and a lot of offices can't do themselves. And it's worth a few thousand dollars in terms of what you can recoup in allowances. Um, Cindy, if you want to email me your information, um, I will connect you with an email to the person that I always use. And the reason I use them is because it's typically my clients that I'm taking to them and they know it's my clients and they dig a little deep into some of the codes that they know that I use. So if you want me to connect you, send me an email and I'll 
I'll do a three, I'll copy you on an email to someone and make the connection. Other than that, it's one person and this person's in marketing and then they move my clients to someone specific. Um, Stacy Schaefer here. Sorry, I know I keep saying last one, but then we get a couple more, um, which is awesome. I love the engagement here. So this is, this is great. Um, does D8220 only apply for fixed appliances for harmful habits or can it be used? Um, oops, sorry. Um, can it be used for, um, sorry. I'll answer, I'll answer that very quickly. A D8020 is a removable appliance, okay? Your D8220 is a fixed appliance. Can it be used for an expander without the habit? You know the answer to that. Like, can it only be fixed by for harmful habits, or can it be used as an, for an expander without the habit? Um, I have offices that have used D eighty two twenty for expanders. Can be awesome. Well, everybody, thank you so much again, Tina. Thank you for for spending the extra time with us. Going thanks for farther. having us. Um, this has been awesome. Again, make sure you know schedule. Uh, you'll come to the masterclass in, in Arizona. It's going to be a full uh, day of this stuff. And we're going to even do deeper dives into, into not just the, um, you know, codes, but the entire insurance process. So uh, definitely would, would love for everybody to, to be there if we, uh, if you can make it, um, it's going to be an awesome time. And uh, again, take advantage of some great promo offers that we're doing for, if you're interested in learning about OrthoVi, if it's, it's not the right fit for you, um, no worries. And, um, but you mean, you, I think it's, it's a great use of your time. Um, and again, if you even just need insurance help, Tina uh, is, is obviously one of the best. So uh, Tina, if you want to just throw your website uh, out there, what's the best place? Obviously, we'll share your email address. You said that's a great way to contact you. Um, but is, is there another way they can kind of learn more about your services and, and how you might be able to help? Um, website is the easiest thing to do. Um, and, you know, kind of let me know what you're interested in. Um, and, you know, I can let you know if I can help you or guide you in another direction. But the website is the best way to do it. Or not the awesome. website, the email. I'm sorry, the email. Perfect. Um, again, thank you guys so much. And I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. And we'll be sharing the me recording too. of this um, in the, you know, probably by very early next week. So um, again, good luck to everybody. Again, thank you all for being here and we look forward to uh, doing this again very soon. Thanks, Brian.